Good morning. Welcome to God's house for the first Sunday in the church season of Advent. We will spend the Sundays in Lent following our Savior's Passion as we go through the combined Lent and Passion history. We'll follow the order of service as printed out. Our opening hymn is I, Jesus I Will Ponder Now on Our Savior's Passion. We'll sing stanzas 1, 3, and 4 and stanzas 6 after the absolution. Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful, and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given his one and only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for all our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord by singing stanza six.
The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Lord, our strength, the battle of good and evil rages within and around us, and our ancient foe tempts us with his deceits and empty promises. Keep us steadfast in your word, and when we fall, raise us up again and restore us through your Son, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. You may be seated. Our psalm for today is psalm number six. We will speak this psalm responsibly. It is a psalm of repentance in which we acknowledge our sins to the Lord and receive the assurance of his gracious forgiveness. Lord, do not rebuke me in your anger. Be merciful to me, Lord, for I am fading away. And my soul is terrified. Turn, O Lord, and deliver my soul. For in death no one remembers you. I am worn out from my groaning. My eyes are blurred by sorrow. Turn away from me, all you evildoers. The Lord has heard my cry for mercy. They will be put to shame. All my enemies will be terrified. In your service folder, please find the wheat-colored sheet. This has the combined passion history. We read lesson one responsibly this morning. This takes us to the upper room where we see Jesus interacting in love with his disciples. We'll read it according to the directions. Pastor Yank and I will be reader one and two, and you obviously are the congregation. The festival of unleavened bread, which is called the Passover, was approaching. Jesus said to his disciples, you know that after two days it will be the Passover, and the Son of Man will be handed over to be crucified. Then the chief priests and the elders of the people assembled in the palace of the high priest, whose name was Caiaphas. They plotted together how to arrest Jesus in some deceitful way and kill him. Satan entered Judas, called Iscariot, who was one of the twelve. He went away and spoke with the chief priests and officers of the temple guard about how he could betray Jesus to them. They were glad and agreed to give him money. He promised to do it and was looking for an opportunity to betray Jesus to them away from the crowd. On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, when the Passover lamb is sacrificed, his disciples asked him, He sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the city, and there a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. Wherever he enters, tell the owner of the house that the teacher says, Where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large upper room furnished and ready. Make preparations for us there. They went and found things just as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. When the hour had come, Jesus reclined at the table with the twelve apostles. He said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it, finds, until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. But he told them, the kings of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who have authority over them are called benefactors. But it is not to be that way with you. Instead, let the greatest among you become like the youngest, and the one who leads like the one who serves. For who is greater, one who reclines at the table or one who serves? Isn't it the one who reclines at the table? But I am among you as one who serves. 
You are those who have remained with me in my trials. I am going to grant a kingdom to you, just as my Father granted to me, so that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom. And you will sit on thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Before the Passover festival, Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved those who were his own in the world, he loved them to the end. Jesus knew that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God. He got up from the supper and laid aside his outer garment. He took a towel and tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter and asked him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered him, You do not understand what I am doing now, but later you will understand. Peter told him, You will never, ever wash my feet. Jesus replied, If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Lord, not just my feet, Simon Peter replied, but also my hands and my head. Jesus told him, A person who has had a bath needs only to wash his feet, but his whole body is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. Indeed, he knew who was going to betray him. That is why he said, not all of you are clean. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord. You are right, because I am. Now if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. Yes, I have given you an example, so that you also would do just as I have done for you. Amen, amen, I tell you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. He took a cup, gave thanks, and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you, from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. While they were reclining and eating, Jesus said, Amen, I tell you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. He said to them, It is one of the twelve, one who is dipping bread with me in the dish. Indeed, the Son of Man is going to go just as it has been written about him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed, It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. After saying this, Jesus was troubled in his spirit and testified, Amen, amen, I tell you, one of you will betray me. The disciples were looking at each other, uncertain which of them he meant. So leaning back against Jesus' side, he asked, Lord, who is it? Jesus replied, It is the one to whom I will give this piece of bread after I have dipped it in the dish. Then he dipped the piece of bread and gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. As soon as Judas took the bread, Satan entered into him. So Jesus told him, What you are about to do, do more quickly. None of those reclining at the table understood why Jesus said this to him. Because Judas kept the money box, some thought that Jesus was telling him, buy what you need for the festival, or to give something to the poor. After Judas left, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify the Son himself, and will glorify him at once. This is the first lesson of the combined passion history. We next go to the children's message. Good morning, children. I bought, brought along a box full of toys. Have a stuffed animal. Have some kind of PJ mask toy here. 
Another stuffed animal, Buzz Lightyear. Got all these toys laying here on the ground. Perhaps you have played with your toys before and left them laying out and made the room a mess. Maybe that's happened to you. Well, there once was a young bo brother and sister who played with their toys and left them laying all out on the floor, and their mom came home and said, this, this room is a mess. I don't want to see these toys laying on the floor anymore. Go pick them up. And the older sister stomped her foot and said, I don't want to pick them up. It's not my job. My little brother should do it. He's younger than me. He should be the one who has to do it. So mother told the younger brother, go pick up your toys. And he stomped his foot and he said, but they're not all my toys. I'm just going to pick up what are my toys. I don't have to pick up my sister's toys. Has that ever happened to you? Have you ever been asked to help somebody out by picking up something or cleaning something and you didn't want to or you felt you shouldn't have to because it's not all your mess? Sometimes we're not very helpful. Well, today in our Passion History lesson, Jesus reminds us that we are to serve one another, meaning we are to be helpful to each other. And Jesus wants us to be helpful to each other, to, to serve each other, because he served us by taking away our sins. See, here's kind of what Jesus did. Imagine that instead of mom coming home and saying, pick up these toys, imagine that God says, pick up all these sins. Instead of toys, these are sins. And God says, pick up all these sins. You've got sin all over the place. I don't want to see your sin anymore. Well, you and I can't pick up our own sins. Even if we wanted to, which we don't, we can't pick them up. And so what Jesus did is he said, even though it's not my mess, even though I didn't commit those sins, I will serve you. I will help you and I will pick up all of your sins and I will put them away so that God does not see them anymore, so that you are completely forgiven. That's how Jesus served you and me. He humbled himself and took away all of our sins. And now he says, just as I served you, go now and serve one another. Let's ask Jesus to help us do that. Jesus, we thank you for serving us by picking up our sins and taking them away before God. Lord, just as you loved us and served us, help us to serve others. Help us, even if it's not our mess, to help others clean up. Help us to show love and compassion. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. We continue with the next hymn.
Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Savior Jesus Christ. Dear friends in Christ, our Passion History lesson for today and for this Lenten season begins with a scene that, that is fitting for an old Western movie, a showdown of sorts. There is Jesus dressed in the white hat, and then you have Judas and the other religious leaders who are wearing the black hats. And that's how it frames it, like there's going to be a showdown. But friends, it's kind of anticlimactic because there is no showdown. Now sure, the guys in the black hats, they plot and they scheme, and Judas will ultimately take the bread, leave the upper room, and betray Jesus. Figuratively, they take their shots, they fire. But Jesus does not return fire at all. And that's because Jesus did not come to win some figurative showdown against flesh and blood. And so he's not trying to stop their plots and their schemes. Instead, Jesus came to serve a world full of sinners by dying to set them free. And that's what Jesus is focused on as our lesson begins for today. Jesus is focused on the service that he will give to this entire world. And yet as he's focused on that, he also teaches his disciples the, primp the principles of servanthood and gives them an example of it. The Passover was quickly approaching. And Jesus' disciples asked him where they, want, where they should make preparations for the Passover to celebrate it. And so Jesus sent two of his disciples into Jerusalem. But he gave them very specific instructions. He told them that when they entered the city, they would meet a man who's carrying a jar of water. And they were to follow that man to a house and enter it and ask the owner of the house, show me the guest room. And the owner of the house would show them a large upper room already furnished. And now the, our lesson says, they went and found things just as he had told them. And then as they gathered to celebrate the Pas Passover meal, Jesus said to his disciples, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. Now those details are very important. Because those details show us that Jesus' suffering and death were what he did to willingly serve us. His suffering and death were part of his service to the world. For what human being, what man, could know the exact details of what the disciples would encounter as they entered the city of Jerusalem? It's a large city. What man could possibly know that the person they would see who is carrying water would lead them to the correct house, to the correct person who would already have a room furnished? Nobody could know those things. And so when the disciples find things just as Jesus had told them, that shows us that Jesus is more than just a man. He is the Son of God who has complete knowledge, complete power, and complete control over all things. So if that's true, how is it then that a group of bad guys in black hats can plot and scheme against the one who knows all things? How can they betray, capture, and even kill the one who has all power and all control? The only way is if the Son of Man or Son of God allows them to do it. The only way is for Him to not make use of His power, His control, His knowledge. The only way is if Jesus serves the world by willingly dying for the world like a Passover lamb. See, the Passover lamb and the continual celebration of the Passover it was a picture of Christ. The Passover lamb and the celebration was a picture of the freedom that the Christ would win from sin, death, and slavery. Excuse me, sin, death, and the devil. Just as the first Passover lamb died to free the Israelites 
from slavery and death in Egypt. And so Jesus came to fulfill that picture of the Passover lamb. And it's while he's eating with his disciples in the upper room that he says, the time has come. The time has come. He will not eat this Passover meal again until he fulfills it as he fulfills his role as the Lamb of God who would die to save sinners. So again, Jesus' foreknowledge of the events that were about to happen is absolutely amazing. But just as amazing is his willingness to stay the course. That he went willingly like a lamb to the slaughter. Only this lamb knew exactly what he was getting into. So even though he had all power, all knowledge, all control, Jesus did not see those things as a reason to keep him from serving others. Now unfortunately, his disciples didn't have that same appreciation for servanthood. Because as they gather at the upper room and as they recline around the table, the disciples have an argument. And they're arguing about which one of them is the greatest. And this is not even the first time that they've had this argument. And so my question is, why is it so important to them? Why is it so important to them as to which one is the greatest that they keep on arguing about this? And I think the answer to that question is the same reason as to why it's important to you and me. Because we still have these same arguments, don't we? Which one of us is the greatest? Who's the best? Who's most important? A week ago, I went through this text with our teens during teen Bible class, and we studied this passion history account together. And it's at this point of our lesson that we took time to talk about how there lives inside every one of us this desire to be first, to be best, to be greatest. And it's at that point that a couple of them began to chuckle. And I asked them, why are you laughing? And they said, because we literally just had that argument last night as to which of us is the best. And they saw themselves in Jesus' words, and they kind of laughed at their own pettiness. And I found that kind of refreshing because the older we get, we don't laugh at it anymore. We try to disguise it and hide it. But it's still there in us. And why is is it that it's so important for us to be best and greatest, to assert our dominance? Isn't Isn't part of it because we believe that if we're best and greatest, everybody else has to serve us? If I am the leader, if I have all power, then people have to do what I say. And that means they have all responsibility. I have no accountability. I can just have pleasure all day long. That's often how the world views power. But that's not how Jesus views it. And that's certainly not how he wants us to use it. And so Jesus called his disciples together in that upper room and he began to teach them the principle of servant leadership. Jesus said to the disciples, let the greatest among you become like the youngest and the one who leads like the one who serves. The principle is this. Those who are great are to use their greatness to serve others. Those who have power and authority to rule are to use that power and authority for the benefit of other people. Now again, that is completely the opposite of how we think about things by nature. By nature, we think, I want to be powerful for my own benefit. And today, Jesus is leading us to think, I want to be powerful for the benefit of my neighbor so I can help them. Now, Jesus is not someone who just teaches this principle, but then doesn't follow it. Jesus is indeed great. There is no one greater than the Son of God. And yet, he didn't demand that people serve him and wait on his every need. Instead, Jesus served the world by dying on the cross to take away their sins. There will never be a more important act of service than Jesus' death on the cross. But the problem for the disciples in the upper room is that that's not something that they could look back on as an example. 
as you and I can. So instead, Jesus had to give them a different example of the service that he's talking about. And so he did. He washed their feet. See, in Jesus' day, walking on dusty, dirty roads in sandals meant that their feet would get dirty. And so when they entered the home of a guest or their own home to eat a meal, they would, it was customary for them to wash their feet. But only washing feet belonged to the role of a servant or a slave. He's the one who washed feet. But in the upper room, we're not told that there are any slaves or servants there. So who is going to wash the feet? Perhaps it's going to be the lowest rank member of the disciples. Such a proposal would certainly spark a debate among them about which one is the greatest, wouldn't it? But it seems rather that the disciples just kind of skipped over this humbling custom and got right to the meal. So it is Jesus. It is Jesus who gets up from the meal, takes off his outer garment, ties a towel around his waist, takes water, and stoops down to wash his disciples' feet. And they let him do it. They let Jesus humble himself and take on the work of a servant to wash their feet. That is, until he came to Peter. And when Jesus came to Peter, Peter objected. It was unthinkable to Peter that Jesus, as great as he would, would stoop as low as to do the work of a servant and wash his feet. But then Jesus replied to Peter, and this is literally what Jesus says according to the Greek. He said, you do not understand what I am doing presently but you will know after these things. More than one theologian believes that Jesus is referring to his passion, his death, and his resurrection when he says, after these things. In other words, Jesus is saying to Peter, Peter, right now you don't understand the kind of humility and love and service I'm going to give to you, but you will one day. And isn't that true? How would Peter ever be able to wrap his mind around the fact that Jesus would suffer and die for his sins when he couldn't understand the fact that Jesus would stoop down to wash his feet? And remember, it's Peter who once said to Jesus, Never, Lord, these things should never happen to you. And Jesus had to say to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. Remember, it's Peter in the Garden of Gethsemane that's swinging the sword to try to keep Jesus from being arrested. And it's Peter who follows Jesus right up to the courtyards of the, t- of the high priest to see what's going to happen because he can't believe these things. He didn't understand, but one day Peter would understand. But in that upper room, Peter objected vehemently to Jesus washing his feet. And so Jesus said to Peter, If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. So then Peter immediately jumps to the other extreme. And he says, well then don't wash my feet. Wash my hands, my head, wash all of me then. Now good for Peter, right? Good for Peter that he desires to be so connected to Jesus that he wants to be completely bathed then if that's what it takes. But Peter misunderstood what Jesus was saying to him. What Jesus was saying is that unless Jesus humbles himself and serves Peter, then Peter will have no part of him. But see, that's the way it is for anyone who gets connected to Jesus. Jesus is the one who brings salvation and faith to sinners. It is all the work of Jesus. He is the one who humbles himself and comes to us through the gospel in word and sacrament to connect himself to us. And when Peter still missed that point and insisted on having a bath, Jesus responded to him and said, Peter, you're already clean. And what Jesus was teaching Peter is this, that through faith, he has already cleansed of all sin as he stands before God. And that's true for you and me too. Through faith in Jesus, we are cleansed of our sins. We are justified, meaning we are declared not guilty of our sin. But we daily sin much. And we need to be cleaned. 
And so day, we have someone who daily and fully forgives all sins to you and me and to every believer. It is Jesus who intercedes for us. Now after Jesus washed the feet of the disciples, he put on his outer garment and he returned to his place at the table. And then he began to instruct them about the importance of the example he just gave them. And when he talked to them about what he just did, he didn't downplay what he did or his role. He said, you call me teacher, and rightly so because I am. You call me Lord or master because he is. They are the servants. He is God. They are flawed and sinful human beings. And yet, their master, their teacher, their Lord was willingly, or willingly humbled himself and served them by washing their feet. And then Jesus said, you are to go and do likewise. Jesus said to them, I have given you an example that you also would do just as I have done for you. Friends, we are Jesus' disciples too. And he has cleansed us from all sin. For all the times that we refused, I mean absolutely refused to humble ourselves and lovingly serve others, Jesus forgives us. But that forgiveness came at a cost. There was a price to it. First of all, Jesus had to be a perfect, humble, and willing servant to all for all the times that we have not been. And he was. But then Jesus also had to suffer and die to face the punishment for our sins. And so it is through Jesus' perfect life and his suffering and death that our sins are removed before God. We have been bathed in the blood of Christ through faith and been washed clean. Therefore, Jesus calls you and me to live with that same kind of willing, humble service to others. See, Jesus teaches us today that love forgets to feel superior to others and instead looks to serve others in their needs, both physical and spiritual. Today, Jesus encourages you and me to be people who can say to themselves, I am loved by my Savior and blessed immeasurably. Therefore, I will willingly help other people, even if helping them makes me less important in the eyes of the world. I will do it because I know that I could not be more important to my Savior. So may Jesus strengthen us to serve one another just as he served us. Amen. Please stand. Now may the peace of God which transcends all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We continue by joining to give together and confessing our faith using the words of the Nicene Creed, which is printed for you in the worship folder. We confess, we believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, True God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church, We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please remain standing as we join our hearts together in prayer.
In our prayers today, we include some of our fellow citizens living in the southern parts of our country who are suffering from severe winter weather. Let us pray. Dearest Jesus, you are eternal and the true God who has all authority, glory, and power. We are your creatures and servants. We are sinful and deserve nothing from you. Yet what a reversal in roles you undertook. In great love, you left behind your authority, glory, and power to come as one who serves. You spent your life in serving sinners and ended your life with your bloody passion. You humbled yourself all the way to giving your life for us sinners on the cross. You truly showed the full extent of your love. For your great love, we give you our thanks and praise, our devotion and worship. We are eternally indebted to you and give you glory for our future life in heaven when we will have opportunity to praise and thank you fully for showing us the full extent of your love. Graciously pardon our sinful selfishness and empower us by your spirit to serve others in love. Keep us totally focused on your cross where you gave yourself as the ransom for our sins. Comfort us through your life-giving words and holy supper. Bless us throughout the season of Lent as we draw near to you in your passion. Merciful Savior, our, our ever-present help in time of trouble, in your wisdom you have permitted severe winter weather to strike some in the southern parts of our country. Heal the injured, console the afflicted, protect the helpless, and deliver all who are still in danger. Through these events, remind us of the ongoing need to seek your gracious help and lead many who do not trust in you as Savior to find in you their life and peace. Lord Jesus, you call all who are weary and burdened to come to you for rest. Rejoicing in your grace, we now come to this heavenly feast in which you give your children on earth, your true body and blood to eat and to drink. Remove from us the dirty garments of self-righteousness and sin and clothe us with the righteousness purchased by your blood. Strengthen our faith in you, increase our love for you and for one another, and after this life grant us a place at your heavenly table. We pray in your name as we also pray together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who brought the gift of salvation to all people by his death on the tree of the cross, so that the devil who overcame us by a tree would in turn by a tree be overcome. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. We stand to pray. We give thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us with this Holy Supper. We pray that through it you will strengthen our faith in you and increase our love for one another. 
We ask this in the, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. You may be seated for the closing hymn. Sweet to the Good morning again to all of you. We welcome guests to worship. We invite you to come again to hear good news from God's word. May our Savior Jesus give each of us comfort and joy in the week ahead as we serve him and others in love. We have an answer from the man we called to serve as eighth grade teacher at TSL, Alex Vandenberg. He writes to us, to my sisters and brothers in Christ at Trinity Lutheran Church and School, Thank you to the kind teachers and leaders of TSL for reaching out to me with a willingness to answer my questions. Thank you especially to Mr. Gustafson and Pastor Yankee. I enjoyed your conversations very much. You're all very blessed with these fine men shepherding your flock. After prayerfully considering the, considering the call you have extended to me, I've decided to return the call. The Lord has more work for me to do here at Zion. I will continue to keep your church and school in my prayers. In Christ's service, Alex Vandenberg. In light of Mr. Vandenberg's decision to return the call, we are scheduling another call meeting here at Trinity two weeks from today on March 7th. We'll have it right after our second service at around 11.45. Sunday Bible class, we are continuing with our study of creation. We will examine Genesis chapter 2 today. I think we'll be returning back downstairs. It's a little bit warmer downstairs than it was last week. This Wednesday, we have the second of our midweek Lenten services. We're examining pictures of our Savior's passion from the Old Testament. We'll examine the prophecy from the Garden of Eden where God said he would send someone to crush the serpent's head. God bless your day and your week ahead.